we're going through the layers of the heart. We're starting off with the endocardium, we're moving to the myocardium, then we're moving to the pericardium. So for the endocardium, the way that we talk about pathology in the endocardium is we talk about what can go wrong in the valves. Valves are part of the endocardium, and so this is our way of getting after that. Uh, aortic insufficiency, we talked about, uh, actually, since we talked pretty at length about this, uh, Andy, could you tell me a little bit about what your client will look like if aortic insufficiency is their uh, diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Aortic valve regurgitation, insufficiency, same thing. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm-hmm. Pulmonary edema. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes. So that and that is really going to cause a lot our patient or client a lot of discomfort, right? Not getting enough oxygen to the brain means they may be syncopizing, they may be feeling, uh, you know, confused, uh, tired, um, you know, having difficulty walking up steps, uh, things of this nature is what we will see. Excellent. Now, um, one of the other, one of the other ways that we mentioned that is uh, really a slam dunk way of knowing what your patient has is looking for this wide pulse pressure. And so what we see with aortic regurgitation, aortic insufficiency, is we get an elevated systolic. So maybe a systolic in the 160s, but anything elevated is, is okay. And a depressed diastolic. So a diastolic maybe in the 40s. This particular change in blood pressure is very specific. Yep, sure, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, no problem. Okay, great. So I'm just going to run and grab a drink of water, actually, and then I'll come back and we should be ready to go. Okay, be right back. Hello, hello. Andy, are you there? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Andy? Oh, okay, great. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> what happened? Oh my god, it was like two minutes. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm glad it happened early rather than we're in the middle of everything. Um, so good. Yes, widened pulse pressure. Uh, seeing this is very, very indicative of your aortic regurgitation. A higher blood pressure in your systolic because your heart is having to pump all that extra blood out. Lower blood on diastolic because rather than the aortic valve closing and maintaining a diastolic blood pressure, the aortic valve opens. Uh, it's, re it's regurgitating. And so that blood is now running back during diastole and giving you a much lower uh, diastolic pressure. Okay. Uh, so tests here, you know, palpating uh, can be helpful. You know, looking for that pulmonary edema. And so with pulmonary edema, one thing that I do want to mention here is that uh, pulmonary edema means that we have fluid within the alveoli. And so there's really two ways to get accumulations of fluid in the lungs. You can either have a pleural effusion where you have fluid outside of the lung, but still within our chest cavity, so it compresses the lung. Or you can have pulmonary edema where you have fluid inside the alveoli themselves. Okay, Both of these are going to cause uh, you know, discomfort and problems for our patient, but they sound a bit different when we put our stethoscope and listen to the client. So for pulmonary edema, the word I want you to look for, your buzzword of the day is crackles. C-R-A-C-K-L-E-S, crackles. That is the sound of pulmonary edema. When you have these fluid-filled alveoli and uh, your patient takes a breath and they start to open, they kind of pop open, which gives you that crackling sound uh, as they uh, take a deep breath in. Versus a pleural effusion, that really gives you more of a dullness to the lung. Uh, and uh, when you listen, the breath sounds are going to sound a bit distant because now you're listening through a layer of fluid um, that has accumulated between the lung and the chest wall itself. Okay. And so this is why we kind of talk about the anatomy and where things are in relation to one another. With pulmonary edema, again, it's in the alveoli. You listen for crackles. A pleural effusion, it's outside of the lung, but still within the chest cavity. And so you listen for more of a distant sound of your breath sounds. Okay. Great. And so treatment for this is going to be pretty consistent across the board. We want to give diuretics, especially when they have pulmonary edema, and that will kind of uh, allow them to uh, diurese a lot of that fluid off. Okay. And so this is a mistake in this slide. This should say stenosis. My apologies for that. So aortic stenosis uh, is, uh, again, a narrowing of the aortic valve. We talked about this at length previously. Uh, common in the elderly, age 65. Any person you meet that's over age 65 has a little bit of aortic stenosis. Whether it's causing them problems or not is what, it's, what uh, we're concerned with. Um, but uh, if you have some other, other problems, other health problems, this will lead you to have a more severe stenosis. What do I mean by that? So patients that have a hypertension for a long period of time, this is a higher blood pressure that that aortic valve has to close against, um, and that will cause um, some stenosis of the valve. Coronary artery disease, rheumatic heart disease tends to affect the mitral valve more than the aortic, but you can see some uh, clients presenting with uh, rheumatic heart disease of the aortic valve as well. Symptoms here, uh, left heart failure, uh, eventually, of course, leading to right heart failure. Syncope, angina, uh, dyspnea, or shortness of breath are sort of our uh, very key symptoms. On physical exam, look for that systolic murmur. We have our stethoscope in the aortic post, and we hear a systolic murmur. That is going to be aortic stenosis all day. Go to the next question. Uh, you can It radiates to the carotid arteries, and so placing your stethoscope at the carotids, uh, you should also be able to hear that whooshing. Uh, is the connection okay? Are you able to hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, let me know if it starts to um, you starts to be you can't hear me. Um, you know, a lot of people in the house right now, so I just want to make sure uh, nothing else is uh, causing the internet to slow down. Just let me know. Okay. Uh, tests echocardiogram simply placing a ultrasound onto the chest wall and uh, and looking at the valves themselves uh, is a pretty good way of determining what's going on as well uh, diuretics um, again pretty universally for all of these different types of 
valvular issues, you want to diurese extra fluid off. So give some diuretics as well as a valve repair for definitive treatment. Now, talking a bit about shock. Shock, a uh, really fancy word that just refers to any condition where the heart is unable to meet the demands of the body. Okay, so pretty universally, the symptoms are going to include rapid breathing, rapid pulse, anxiety and nervousness, some mottled skin coloring, profuse sweating, poor capillary refill. Uh, these are all symptoms of decreased perfusion of our organs. Uh, now, de depending on the cause of shock is going to determine what our strategy is going to be, uh, both in positioning of the uh, clients as well as pharmacologically, how do we care for this client? Okay. And so we, sh we should be comfortable with all these symptoms. Uh, what is capillary refill? Can you tell me a bit about capillary refill? Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Excellent. Yeah. So essentially, you know, you're just, you're just pinching the nail, like you told me. And uh, when you pinch the nail, it's going to blanch or appear a bit a lighter than previously um, and then how long it takes to go back to normal is your capillary refill time and so what is a normal capillary refill and what capillary refill would you uh, be concerned about greater than 30 seconds would be abnormal right is it yeah okay good yeah you're absolutely right uh, greater than three seconds would be concerning that more seconds you add on to that the further the stage of, um, of hypovolemia, essentially, uh, your client is going to be at. Okay, Many different tests, depending on the cause of shock. Treatment in general is going to be to increase the blood pressure. So norepinephrine. This is what we refer to as a vasopressor. Vasopressor. And uh, the reason that we call it that, um, so vaso essentially means vessel. Presser means we're increasing the pressure. And so here, norepinephrine is going to go systematically, systemically, to all of our arterioles and cause them to constrict. Constricting those arterioles will elevate our blood pressure. And uh, ultimately, um, you know, if you have a, a client who has a blood pressure 80 over 40, we should be able to bring that blood pressure up by causing vasoconstriction system-wide. Dobutamine is going to increase the strength of our heart contractions the strength of our heart contractions. And so if the shock, the cause of shock is because our heart is not contracting strong enough, if it's a cardiogenic shock, we can give dobutamine and our heart is going to start pumping much harder, going to be pumping more blood with each pump and uh, distributing that blood to the client's whole body, okay? So norepinephrine is a vasopressor and uh, dobutamine is really more of a cardiac medication that can be used to increase blood pressure. Universally, these patients need to get IV fluids um, uh, to raise their blood pressure. Okay. So um, here we have a client who arrives in the emergency department after a motor vehicle accident. Nursing assessment findings include blood pressure of 80 over 34, pulse rate of 120, respirations of 20. What is the client's most appropriate priority nursing diagnosis? Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good, that's exactly where I want you to be at. I want you to be thinking about ABCs. So um, any of these answer choices related to ABCs, that should be your answer because you know that this client is acute, that this client uh, really rapidly needs intervention. And so thinking about what the nursing diagnosis is, think about our ABCs and then look in the question stem for which of the ABCs may be abnormal. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. Mm hmm. I agree. The, the blood pressure is very concerning. Uh, that's probably where we want to target our, our diagnosis. Very good. B, excellent, yes. So, uh, considering this patient was in a motor vehicle accident and now has a low blood pressure, if I just gave you those two pieces of facts, those two pieces of information, your mind is instantly gonna jump to, well, this patient is bleeding out somewhere, right? Uh, motor vehicle accident and a low blood pressure equals our patient now has some injury uh, that is causing them to lose blood volume. How do we, you know, how do we treat blood volume? We need to increase the amount of blood. And so uh, the most priority thing, while we are concerned about cerebral tissue perfusion, this is very important. Um, however, this is not the most immediate priority. The most immediate priority is saving this person's life. Yes, we want to make sure the brain is being perfused, but the goal in restoring a euvolemic state with a normal blood pressure is to make sure all of our organs receive um, sufficient uh, tissue perfusion, okay? And so, uh, fluid volume deficit really gets at what the problem is. Now, why not ineffective airway clearance? I remember that was one of the answers that you initially were thinking about. What sort of changed your mind on that one? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very good. So respiration, the, the normal limit of respirations, depending on what source you look at, can be anywhere from 16, 17, 18. But 20 is definitely tachypnic. Um, but it's at, while it is tachypnic, it's not 30. Right, this patient is not hyperventilating at this point. And so anything in the airway, we can kind of rule out because while it is slightly tachypnic, uh, it's, not, um, it's not a primary, it's not as, as uh, critical as this blood pressure. Okay, very good. Uh, and so alteration in sensory perception, obviously that's not the right answer. So great, uh, fluid volume deficit. And so like you said, we would wanna get this uh, client fluids as fast as possible. Okay, very good. Uh, so what the, the name we would give to this type of client would be a client suffering from hypovolemic shock, low volume shock. Here we have a poor blood volume, which is preventing the heart from pumping enough blood to the body. Uh, causes of this trauma is going to be our number one. However, uh, you know, people suffering from diarrhea for an extended period of time. Think about, you know, in the third world, people suffering from cholera. Cholera causes uh, extensive diarrhea that ultimately leads to hypovolemia. Uh, patients with burns end up having a lot of the fluid leaving their vasculature, leaving the vessels of their body, and entering the tissue because that fluid is there to sort of relieve a lot of that burn, burned area. Now, instead of having our volume in our vessels, it's in the tissue, and now the heart doesn't have enough volume, essentially, to pump. GI bleeds is something that we need to be aware of as well. Uh, our treatment here is a rapid infusion of IV fluids. And so the question is, what kind of IV fluid are we going to use? Are we going to want to use IV saline? Or are we going to want to transfuse? How do you make your decision there? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Very good. Yes. So, in the trauma, in the trauma uh, bay, when this client comes in and we're rapidly trying to restore blood pressure, 
the blood is not going to be right there in the trauma bay. And 99% of hospitals, this the blood is not going to be right there for you to use. Um, not only do you need to send down for blood, a lot of times the um, blood bank is going to want you to do a type and screen and figure out what type of blood this patient uh, or this client even has so that they can send the right type. And so in the trauma bay, in the immediate, as soon as they come in, we're just going to transfuse saline to try and get the blood pressure up. But saline can't carry oxygen. And so eventually we are going to need to transfuse blood. If that means giving type O negative blood uh, because we don't have time to do a typing screen, that may be the case. But um, in most cases, we're going to start with a normal saline and then eventually transfuse subsequent to that. Okay, great. Uh, the next type of shock we can talk about is a cardiogenic shock. So this type of shock is the genesis of the shock is our cardio, is our heart. And so here we have some problem in the heart that's causing our tissues not to receive enough oxygen, right? We're breaking down these words because, you know, they throw these fancy words at things. It's very, 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 very simple. Shock is always when our tissues don't get enough oxygen. Depending on the type, we put a little name in front of it. Here, it's because of the heart. So our patient has enough volume. However, the heart is not pumping enough blood to the tissues. So most commonly, this is going to be a client who had a history of a myocardial infarction or is currently having a myocardial infarction. When you have this MI, you lose cardiac muscle. Cardi if you have less muscle, obviously, there's less ability to pump uh, blood, oxygen-filled blood to the extremities. Other causes could be a cardiomyopathy, a myocarditis, or a inflammation of the muscle of the heart, uh, some drug-induced arrhythmias like our ventricular tachycardia, uh, septal defect, ruptured valve. Just Cardiogenic just means it's coming from the heart. The heart's not pumping enough blood. So the symptoms kind of depend on the etiology. Obviously, if it's a myocardial infarction, if it's a heart attack, you know the symptoms. Chest pain, radiating to the arm or the chin, uh, crushing sensation, in the chest, uh, squeezing, um, shortness of breath, these things that we're used to talking about are gonna be there. Uh, if it's an arrhythmia, however, look for palpitations, that feeling of your heart skipping a beat. Uh, syncope or passing out can be due to a arrhythmia as well. Uh, mental status changes, hypotension, a rapid heartbeat, uh, pulmonary edema as we start to have uh, blood backing up at the lungs, distended jugular veins, if it's a right heart, uh, a cardiogenic shock, we would see more of that right heart failure type symptoms like jugular vent venous distension. Uh, cool extremities that, uh, you know, capillary refill time is going to be increased and a decreased urine output. This is one of those things that I really want you to kind of put a star by because it's something that's not really emphasized, but I want you to think about because the whole way of the whole um, mechanism for us to produce urine is to have blood constantly flowing to the kidneys. In any state of shock, the amount of blood flowing both to the brain, to the extremities, and to the kidneys is going to drop. That means your urine output is going to drop. You can't have someone who's hypovolemic and is just peeing out a liter a day. It doesn't happen. It's not possible. It's dependent on blood flow. So look for urine output as a sign that, you're, that your client is going through shock. Okay, That is really going to pay big dividends for you. Uh, treatment, we're going to assess the airway, breathing, circulation, as always, identify and treat the underlying cause. We want to be supportive. So we can give a fluid bolus um, and to try and elevate that blood pressure. Oxygen is really going to be one of those first line things that we do whenever our patient is going in shock. Uh, medically, uh, dopamine is going to be a first line. Dopamine is uh, one of our vasopressors as well, as is norepinephrine, both vasopressors. And dobutamine is going to increase the contraction of the heart. If the heart, if it's a cardiogenic problem, increasing the contraction of the heart should help out quite a bit. Okay. Great. And so just sort of looking at our different causes of cardiogenic shock, we mentioned that are an infarct of the muscle of the heart. So here, having a myocardial ischemia, myocardial ischemic event means part of the muscle of our heart is going to die. Now, if that part of the muscle dies, it's not contracting anymore. That means blood is just accumulating here in the left ventricle and is not being pumped to the brain, to the extremities, etc., etc. causes of shock. Right ventricular infarct, this means that blood is not being pumped to the lungs. This is just as bad. Now, uh, blood is not moving into the lungs, so it cannot return to the left ventricle cannot be pumped to the extremities. We're not having oxygen. And so here we would see more of a jugular venous distension um, rather than with a left ventricular infarct, we would see more pulmonary edema. 
And that kind of goes after what we talked about before with our signs of right heart failure and our signs of left heart failure. It's a little bit different. Okay. Pulmonary embolism. Here we have a, uh, some sort of blockage in the pulmonary artery that does not allow blood to move from the right ventricle into the lungs. And so we should have a dilation of our right ventricle, dilation of our right atrium. Our JVD will be there as well. Cardiac tamponade is when we have accumulation of fluid between the myocardium and the pericardium. And so before we said that there's three layers of the heart, we said that there's a endocardium, there's our myocardium, and there's our pericardium. Uh, and the pericardium is that pouch on the outside of the heart that prevents any friction from building between the heart and the lungs that surround it. It has a little bit of fluid inside, kind of like a lotion, to make sure that as the heart is beating, it's able to do so without generating friction. Now, if we have some sort of process like an infection of our pericardium, we can start to have more and more fluid accumulating in this area of the pericardium. And it can start compressing on the myocardium, compressing on the ventricle itself. And so what you see here in this image is that uh, we have accumulation of something. It can be blood. It can be, uh, you know, from an infection, having all of that uh, pus and what have you there really starts to accumulate and push on the ventricles and limits the amount of blood that those ventricles can push out. Okay. Any kind of endocarditis of the mitral valve and, um, you know, any kind of myocardial infarction, myocarditis leading to tachycardia can also cause cardiogenic shock. Okay, great. So heart failure, whose side are you on? Right heart versus left heart. We need to be able to differentiate what uh, our symptoms are depending on which side of the heart is affected. And so think about what, where does blood come from to get to the right heart? It comes from the venous system of our upper extremities of our brain. It comes from the liver uh, and the whole portal system. It comes from our lower extremities. And so when you have a right-sided heart failure, look for congestion in all those places. From the upper extremities, we would have a jugular venous distension in the neck. Uh, the classic way to look for this is to have your patient look to the side uh, while reclining at 45 degrees in a semi-fowlers and look at the neck and what you would see is that there's a vein there that's very distended, very plump and um, full of blood. That's your jugular venous distension. Uh, and it, there's blood accumulating at the liver. And so when you press on the liver, there should be a little bit of pain. The liver should feel a little bit larger than normal. And then at the lower extremities, you can just look for your pitting edema uh, as your manifestation of peripheral edema or blood being congested at the lower extremities. And so just sort of going through the symptomology, right upper quadrant pain, that's the pain at the liver because of that congestion of blood. Right ventricular heave, placing your fingers on the sternum right above the right ventricle, you should feel a heaving sensation of that right ventricle as it beats. You may have a tricuspid murmur. Uh, weight gain is common as this edema starts to build up. Uh, nausea as well as the anorexia is because of all of this extra fluid in your GI system. Uh, is causing you to feel nauseous and anorexic. Elevated right atrial pressure, elevated central venous pressure, peripheral edema. Ascites are um, dilated veins uh, that you can see on the abdomen. And hepatomegaly is our swollen liver. And you can have a swollen spleen as well, which would be your splenomegaly. Okay. Um, the ascites should show up on the skin. Yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The ascites, uh, you will be able to see on the skin, just dilated vessels, just dilated vessels. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, left sided heart failure. What we look for here, left ventricular heave. So now we're moving our fingers around to about the area right under the nipple and, uh, placing our fingers there and feeling for our right ventricle kind of heaving back and forth. Uh, confusion, uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And so what this means is that oftentimes these patients will get up at night suddenly short of breath. Now, why does this happen late at night? Well, when, think about your patient with left... Oh, sorry. Excellent. Good. You're lying down. And so what this is going to do is uh, as we have this fluid accumulating in the lungs, yes, I told you that it is in the alveoli itself, but for the sake of a metaphor, let's just pretend it's like a little lake 
here at the bottom of the lungs. This is our patient while they're standing. And so here, our patients have about 75% of their lungs that they're still able to use, right? The fluid is just accumulating at the bottom and it's not really affecting them too much. As these patients lie down, this fluid is now going to start to cover a much wider range of how much lung tissue they have. And so now much more of their lungs are going to be affected while they're lying down. And so this gives us our nocturnal dyspnea, right? Our shortness of breath because this fluid has now moved to cover more of the uh, lung tissue overall. Okay. And so when you see paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and when you see orthopnea, Ortho essentially means movement. And so when you see patients who have, are short of breath when lying down, but are okay when sitting up, this is the same thing. Orthopnea, proxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, they're talking about the same thing. This, um, this fluid that's moving to cover more of the lung while their patients lie down. Okay, and so what you may hear, even when you talk to your clients about sleeping at night, what you can ask them is, uh, when you sleep at night, how many pillows do you use? Uh, it's gonna sound like an odd question to ask, but you, what you're going to find is patients with left-sided heart failure tend to use five, six, seven pillows so that rather than sleeping lying down, they're actually semi-erect while sleeping. And that is going to help them to oxygenate their lungs while sleeping. Okay. DOE is dyspnea on exertion. When these clients try and exert themselves going upstairs, walking around the block, they're going to become short of breath. So fatigue and S3 gallop we talked about in a fluid overloaded state. We have this S3 gallop. This is the, our pouring a glass of water into a bathtub. Our heart is full of blood already. Now we open up the valve and blood comes in and it's just sort of sloshing around giving us that S3. Crackles is our pulmonary edema, tachycardia, a cough, some mitral murmurs possible, sweating and diaphoresis is possible as well as they start to have the symptomology of uh, congestive heart failure. Okay. Questions on this. Does this make sense why the symptoms are a bit different depending on why, uh, which side of the heart is affected? Yeah? Okay, great. Okay, great. So now we can move into our endocarditis. Here we have a endocardium is that innermost layer of the heart, which includes the heart valves. So we have an infection of the heart valve. Uh, can be caused by fungi, bacteria. We're not really worried about what the exact cause is, but what we're worried about is the symptoms. So weakness a fever. And this fever is not, you know, your patient that comes in with a sudden 105 fever. They were fine yesterday and now they're super sick. With endocarditis, this tends to have a chronic course. Chronicity is a very big part of this picture. As those, um, as those growths of bacteria start to grow on the valves, it's going to become worse and worse and worse. So this is a fever that's typically going to be a low fever, a 101, 100.5, 100.8. It's going to be a low fever, but this is going to be a client who's had the fever for a significant period of time, say four weeks, six weeks, um, uh, you know, two months. This is going to be uh, uh, something that is not acute, but rather chronic. Okay. Because this is an infection of a valve, look for that murmur, look for that shortness of breath. Night sweats are typical. Uh, Janeway lesions, and I think I have a picture here. Yes. So a Janeway lesion is essentially a little bit of bacteria that's growing right under the skin. And so if we can look at our heart, here's our valve, right? We'll say this is our mitral valve. Here's our left ventricle. Every time, here's our left atrium. Every time this valve opens, here's our little growth. Every time this valve opens, we are going to have uh, a little bit of that bacteria joining in with the blood that's leaving. Not a big chunk of bacteria, but say just, you know, two or 300 little bacterial bugs are going to join with that blood supply. So now that blood supply is going to go out the left ventricle into the aorta. It's going, you know, these bugs are going to be separated. They're going to go, some are going to go to the brain. Some are going to go to the lower extremities. Some are going to go to the GI tract. Some are going to go to the hands. But this is not a large enough colony to cause a huge infection there. Right. Uh, typically, you know, this is not going to be a huge abscess in the brain or, you know, some sort of really terrible GI infection. Typically, this is just like, you know, a few, you know, 50 or 60 individual bacteria that are going to these places showing up. Our immune system can pretty quickly deal with it. Um, and so what this looks like is in the hand, you may see a, a small, flat macule in the hand that looks red. It's painless. And what we call this is a Janeway lesion. 
And what this is, is a small little bit of bacteria got knocked off of that valve as it moved from the left atrium to the left ventricle, and now is causing a tiny little infection under the skin that our immune system can deal with quickly, okay? So that's what we see with this endocarditis. A uh, little bits of bacteria are going to be joining the blood supply and causing this, okay? The other thing you can see is an Osler node, and Osler nodes are painful. The way you remember this is ouch Osler. It has the same etiology. Essentially, uh, it's just a little bit more bacteria uh, manifest an infection here, and so it's a little bit more painful. It's going to be raised rather than flat like the Janeway lesion. Okay. Great. Uh, so joint pain, as some of those bacteria uh, get lodged into the joints, we can have a little bit of pain. The tests we would like to do in this case, a CBC is helpful. ESR tells us if there's inflammation. Uh, a um, electrocardiogram to look at if there's been some sort of cardiomyopathy can be helpful. And blood cultures, gotta do blood cultures, okay? And so the important thing with blood cultures is that we take them from multiple sites. Uh, when you do a blood culture, you'll need to take at least two, and they should be from separate sites. So you'll take one blood culture from the hand, one blood culture from the foot, one blood culture from the left hand, one from the right hand. Um, something like that to ensure that um, you, know, you are able to kind of catch whatever is in the blood. The presence of splinter hemorrhages on physical exam are essentially just a little bit of hemorrhage under the nail. That looks a little bit like a splinter. Same etiology as our Janeway lesions, just a little bit of bacteria getting under there, which our immune system is dealing with, as well as there should definitely be a murmur on uh, physical exam. Treatment is going to be antibiotics and monitor our patient for any uh, subsequent um, problems such as arrhythmias, congestive heart failure. Uh, glomerulonephritis is an infection of the glomerulus of the kidney. And so, you know, our kidney, uh, when we have blood supply going to the kidney, it joins into this spaghetti looking thing and then it leaves. And then from that spaghetti looking thing, uh, some of the blood will be filtered out into the kidney and then leave the body as urine. So this is our glomerulus and this is where bacteria can cause an infection at the kidney. Septic emboli is essentially a piece of bacteria that gets into the bloodstream and goes somewhere and causes a big problem. So while we talked about how Janeway lesions, splinter hemorrhages, Osler nodes, it's just a tiny bit of bacteria that's causing not really a problem, but more of a symptom. If you have a large chunk of bacteria that's able to get to the brain, say, that would cause an abscess or a bacterial growth in the brain. And so we would call that a septic embolus. Okay. Great. It could. So septic shock, uh, we talked about shock. What would septic shock be? So good. So a shock essentially means not enough perfusion. So uh, low blood pressure, you're absolutely right. That could be the cause. And septic means it's from a bacteria. And so in, a se I'm so glad you asked about this. And so in a septic shock, anytime you have a bacterial uh, infection of the bloodstream, Cause, called sepsis, right? Um, that can cause, because bacteria have a lot of inflammatory type proteins, they can cause vasodilation of all of our arteries. And so when you vasodilate all the arteries in your system, your blood pressure is going to drop like a rock. Okay. And so in septic shock, you actually have an infection of the bloodstream rather than having in, in endocarditis what you have is a, an infection of this valve that's throwing little bits of bacteria out if it throws enough bits of bacteria out and now we have an infection of the bloodstream that would lead to septic shock okay and so uh, it's really the volume of bacteria that's in the blood that is uh, going to allow for sepsis to take hold and for sepsis to lead to septic shock. And I'm so glad you asked about that because we're able to kind of talk about what the pathogenesis is. And so, you know, when we talk about obviously all of our, our um, patients in shock need to get fluids, keep in mind that it's especially important to give vasopressors in septic shock because the pathology behind it is that these bacteria with their inflammatory proteins are causing vasodilation. So we want to directly counteract that, give vasopressors and get that blood pressure up. Okay. Good. As well as antibiotics, we're really going to hit them with some heavy antibiotics to try and tamp down the infection. Wonderful. Great. 
so that is our endocardium. Next layer of the heart is our myocardium. This is the muscle of the heart. So myocarditis is simply an inflammation of the heart muscle. Uh, the causes here can be bacterial, can be viral, but really, uh, I mean, you know, people don't really get polio in the United States anymore. So really, this is not one we're going to be worried about. What I'd like you to know about is our adenovirus, which is a common virus in school children. Um, it typically causes things like an upper respiratory tract infection, you know, um, a lot of uh, um, congestion, sneezing, coughing, these types of things is what adenovirus typically causes. But in uh, people that don't have a strong immune system, like our elderly, it can go on to cause a myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart muscle. Same thing for our Coxsackie. So symptoms here are going to be leg edema, anything that you would think of with decreased functioning of our cardiac muscle. I almost don't need to list it for you because we've talked about it at length here. Uh, so leg edema, shortness of breath, joint pain, uh, syncope, uh, unable to lie flat, arrhythmias. These are all things that we would associate with uh, a dysfunctional heart muscle. Um, however, it, when you layer on top of that a fever, uh, viral symptoms like malaise, that really points you in the direction of myocarditis as the cause of your client's symptoms. So what do we need to do testing-wise? A chest x-ray, look for swelling of the heart. Echocardiogram, ECG, look for functioning of the heart. White blood cell count is going to be key here. We know that it has some infectious cause, so let's do a white blood cell count. And what number do we look for on white blood cell count to confirm an infectious cause? So I think that you're thinking of platelets. That would be normal for platelets, yes. So excellent, yes, 10,000. Under 10,000 is completely normal. And really for infectious, we want to see 12,000. Greater than 12, we say, okay, this, this person has some sort of infection going on. And if it's not an infection, then it must be a tumor of white blood cells called lymphoma or leukemia, okay? It's got to be infection or some sort of uh, leukemia, okay? but more than likely it's an infection. Okay, good. So white blood cells greater than 12 tell us there's an infection going on, wonderful. Uh, blood cultures, uh, if we suspect bacteria, we can do a blood culture. However, blood cultures are not helpful for viruses. Cultures are allow you to grow bacteria, allow you to grow fungus in a very um, effective way. <clears throat> However, for viruses, it's kind of hard to grow viruses in culture. So not terribly helpful, but we do them anyway to rule out other causes. Okay. Uh, diuretics <clears throat> here to kind of diurese, get some of that extra fluid off. Uh, if our client is having arrhythmias, they may uh, need a pacemaker. Antibiotics are helpful for uh, bacteria, not viruses, right? And steroids, surprisingly, are very helpful for myocarditis because they decrease inflammation. Steroids universally decrease inflammation, so th that can be helpful there. Uh, we're going to monitor this patient to see if this inflammation goes from the myocardium to the next layer, that protective layer, the pericardium, and we would call that a pericarditis, so monitor the patient for that, and monitor the patient for cardiomyopathy, a swelling of the heart. This is why we get our chest x-ray. This is why we get our echo. This is why we get our uh, electrocardiogram, is to look for swelling of the heart due to this inflammation. So the last layer of the heart that we need to talk about is the pericardium. Here with pericarditis, there is a lot of different causes here. With that little pouch of fluid, a lot of things can get there and cause inflammation. So viruses is probably gonna be number one. So Coxsackie, adenovirus, even the influenza. You know, you have a patient that gets the flu and then um, you know, four or five days into it starts to have this chest pain associated with pericarditis that uh, you know, is a typical history for your clients. Uh, it can be bacterial from many different um, bacteria, fungi, it's associated with tuberculosis, kidney failure, your clients that are on your renal floors uh, for dialysis, if their uh, levels of uric acid in the blood or urea in the blood get too high, that can cause a pericarditis, uh, AIDS, autoimmune disorders, and think about our clients who get a surgery for maybe one of their valves. They had aortic regurgitation. The cardiologist went in there, replaced the valve. Now, a few days later, they have pericarditis because in replacing that valve, 
the um, surgeon or cardiologist somehow uh, irritated the pericardium, and that can lead to a pericarditis as well. Symptoms here, dry cough, uh, pleuritis or irritation of the pleura as well, uh, fever, feelings of anxiety, crackles, effusion around the lungs themselves, lower extremity swelling, inability to lie flat, the things we associate with uh, uh, right heart failure we can see with pericarditis. And the last thing that I'd like to add on to here, which is um, the one sign that almost always confirms pericarditis, like if you hear this, it's 100% pericarditis, is something called a pericardial crunch. All right, peri and then crunch. And um, I know the word crunch doesn't exactly sound scientific, but if you look in your text, you're going to see it described this way. Essentially, in pericarditis, uh, when you have those two layers that are supposed to have fluid, but now they're irritated, every time the heart beats, there's going to be a crunch, 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 crunch sound. As those layers are irritated and rubbing against one another, it's called pericardial crunch. And if you hear that, that's boom, pericarditis. Move on to the next question. You already know the diagnosis, okay? Pericardial crunch. So our tests we can do here, auscultation, we can do an MRI and really look closely at the heart. Our CT scan, echocardiogram is gonna be a key to really visualize the pericardium and see how it looks. Uh, chest X-ray, blood culture, CBC, depending on the cause, those can be helpful. Uh, treatment here, this is what we need for the NCLEX exam. NSAIDs, NSAIDs, NSAIDs. If you give a client with pericarditis and aspirin, you are going to decrease both the symptoms and the pathology by uh, leaps and bounds. For whatever reason, NSAIDs, ibuprofen, uh, aspirin, these drugs really work well at, at treating pericarditis. Not Tylenol, not acetaminophen. This gets us into a very big differentiation between our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin, like ibuprofen, like, um, uh, what's another one, ketorolac. Those are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and are acetaminophen, like Tylenol. Acetaminophen works at the central nervous system. It decreases pain. It's helpful for your patients who are having things like osteoarthritis, knee pain, things of this nature. However, if there's a client who actually has inflammation, you need an anti-inflammatory. That's where you would use your aspirin, your ibuprofen, your ketorolac. So those are going to decrease your inflammation as well as decrease the pain. It's going to do both. And so I know what you're thinking. If these NSAIDs are so effective at you know decreasing inflammation as well as decreasing pain, why not? Why give Tylenol at all? Why do we bother? with Tylenol if we can just give a drug that does both. What is a drawback of our NSAIDs? Or what sort of problems can they cause down the line? It's, it's okay. So one problem with taking ibuprofen for a long period, I mean, think about a client taking ibuprofen for a long period of time or aspirin every day for five years. That client is going to come to you because they have GERD. That client is going to come to you because they have a peptic ulcer. Essentially, NSAIDs decrease the protective lining of the stomach. And so the acid really starts to erode at the stomach. These clients are going to have heartburn. They're going to have reflux of acid. They're going to have ulcers in the lining of their stomach because that's what NSAIDs do to the stomach. Okay. So this is why we don't give, we don't, you know, just give anyone an NSAID. We need to know sort of, do they have any history of um, heartburn and things of this nature before we give it. Otherwise, very good drug. Um, but should not be taken for a long period of time. The other problem with NSAIDs is they also cause kidney damage, but that's sort of a very long period of time that they're taking NSAIDs. Uh, more commonly, uh, the kidney damage, yeah, yeah. So, the, so I'm glad you thought of that too, because that's, that's an important one as well. Um, but you know, when you have clients, and this is going to be a lot of clients that you see who are taking, uh, ibuprofen every day while they're drinking coffee and, uh, you know, having eight beers at the end of the night, 
that client has zero stomach lining left. Okay. Um, so, you know, gastritis is going to be a big part of the picture, decreasing the amount of, um, uh, ibuprofen and these over the counter NSAIDs is going to be a big, important part of treating them. Okay. Great. Uh, and if we have accumulation of fluid in that pericardial sac, we, what we can do is we can go in with a needle and drain that fluid out, uh, and that should help some of the symptoms. If it doesn't help, we may even need to take out all of the pericardium altogether, okay? So pericardectomy means take away that la protective layer. Again, we are gonna have some sort of uh, issues down the line because uh, now the heart is directly rubbing on the lungs, and so our lungs are not gonna like that. We may end up with some lung issues uh, later down the line, but uh, you kind of have to uh, pick your poison at that point. Okay, and so great. Next, uh, it, we can look at sort of what that image looks like. Here's our normal pericardium. Uh, this is a view of the right side of the heart. You can see this is the right atrium, right ventricle. And here is the lining going around the entire heart. It's just this fibrous layer. When you have that inflammation, that virus, what have you, inf causing inflammation, uh, this is how it appears. Um, with the pericarditis. Okay, great. So next question here. We have a healthcare provider performing an assessment on a patient who is taking propranolol, aka Indorol, you may see it as either on your exam, for supraventricular tachycardia. Which assessment finding is an indication that the patient is experiencing an adverse effect of this drug? Excellent. That's correct. Yes. Mm hmm. Excellent. Yes. Bradycardia means we've given way too much propranolol and we need to uh, take it back a notch. Um, bradycardia is, can be just as bad as tachycardia if, you know, our, our client ends up in shock, right? And so that's definitely uh, one of the adverse effects. Great job. Okay, great. So now we can talk a bit about EKGs. Um, there are EKGs on the NCLEX exam, as I'm sure you know. I'm sure you saw some of them there. Uh, and so what we're going to go through is the uh, general um, geography or the general anatomy of a EKG, what we're looking at, what it's a P wave. We're going to talk about that. And then secondly, we're going to talk and uh, do a quick quiz on some of the most commonly asked about uh, pathologic EKGs. Okay. And so first, um, let's have a look at the conduction through the heart. And so what I told you last time we met was there was a Indiana Jones movie, Temple of Doom, the bad guy reaches into the heart, uh, or into the chest of one of the other characters, pulls out the heart and the heart keeps beating very traumatic for a 10 year old, but I don't want to get into that. Um, that actually has a lot of um, grounding in reality in that the heart produces its own beat. Okay, while the rest of our system can alter the speed of the beat, our heart um, creates its own beat. Okay, and so when we do beta blockers and slow down the beat, or we do some sort of dobutamine and increase the beat, um, that's our way of altering it. However, the heart makes its own beat. And so where it makes its own beat is here in the SA node. This is where the beat is going to be generated. And so the first thing we see in an EKG is going to be the signal coming from the SA node. Okay. Uh, so the SA node is going to travel, uh, send signal to the atria. And this signal is going to cause a contraction of the atria. When the atria contract, they're going to force blood into the ventricles. Okay, great. Now we have the blood into the ventricles we need to tell the ventricles it's time to pump. And so that same signal that went through the atria is gonna continue on 
They're the same signal, not a new one, not a different one. It's the same electrical impulse is going to continue forward. It's going to hit the AV node. The AV node is going to pause for a second to allow for the ventricles to fill. And then boom, it's going to send the signals down these bundle branches is what they're called and uh, send it to the ventricular muscle. That ventricular muscle is going to contract and pump the blood out of the heart. Great. We did it. Now let's do it all over again. We're going to start at the SA node, go through to the AV node, go through the, uh, you know, the bundle branches, through these Purkinje fibers, and uh, send another signal. Okay. Great. So uh, here's sort of a uh, brief description that I'm pretty sure I copied from some website about um, each different part of the EKG. But I really think it's more helpful to look at the EKG itself to really visualize what's going on. So here, P wave, first part of the EKG is our P wave. Uh, this is going to signal the atria contracting. The first part of our whole cardiac cycle is those atria contracting and pumping the blood into the ventricles. And so the P wave represents that. Okay, so great. So what comes next? What's after the P wave? QRS, great. So the Q is gonna be this first dip that we see. The R is going to be the peak and the S is going to be the second dip, okay? And so the QRS, what does that signify? Very good, yes. The QRS is the ventricles contracting, okay? They are contracting, they are pumping that blood out of the heart and we're able to catch that uh, information on our QRS complex. Great, and so what is this little last little hump that's sticking out here? Excellent. Yes, our T wave represents uh, ventricular relaxation. Great. So we have ventricular contraction, we have ventricular relaxation, um, and then we have atrial contraction. Why don't we see atrial relaxation? This is sort of trivia more than for the NCLEX, but why is it on a, a EKG you can't see the uh, atria relaxing? This is not, again, not. Essentially, essentially uh, where the relaxation of the atria would be, would be uh, right around from about this point to this point is where we would be able to see it. And we have this huge muscle that's totally distorting the electrode. Uh, and so that's why we can't see it because the QRS complex is happening on top of it. And uh, it really kind of in that tug of war of what our sensor is picking up, the uh, it's going to pick up the greater signal. And so the greatest signal is that QRS complex, the ventricular contracting. And again, not something you'd be asked about, but just, uh, you know, something kind of interesting, I guess, not super interesting, but something for your own knowledge. OK, and so we list uh, essentially what all those findings are down here. OK. Great. Now, uh, one last thing I want to mention before we move forward. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned it before. I don't think I did. Uh, you can see that EKGs are always uh, are always drawn, written, whatever, on top of these boxes. And these boxes actually help us quite a bit in, uh, when it comes to pathology. Okay. And so one of the most important findings that you can find on an EKG in determining where your pathology is is looking at how many of these little boxes make up your QRS complex. As you can see, this QRS complex is under three boxes. Under three boxes. Okay? That is the size of a normal QRS complex. Under three boxes. As long as your QRS complex is under three boxes, the problem that you're having has to be somewhere else other than the ventricles. A QRS under three boxes tells you that the ventricles are doing what they're supposed to be doing. The AV node is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And so anytime you see, you're gonna see very small QRS complexes, yes, in say your supraventricular tachycardia is gonna have very, very tiny QRS complexes, but anytime it is under three boxes, you know that the ventricles are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're just getting um, some sort of disordered signaling from the SA node, from the atria, something's happening above the level of the AV node, okay? That is the one thing, if you, if you only learn one thing 
from me in terms of EKGs, I hope it's this. Look for your uh, QRS to be less than three boxes. Okay, and we'll apply that idea coming up shortly. Okay, so arrhythmia, fancy word. All it means is an irregular heartbeat, uh, irregular rhythm. And there's many different types, everything from bradycardia and tachycardia to V-fib, Wolf-Parkinson-White, V-tac, uh, sinus tachy, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. There's a lot of different types of arrhythmias. Not all of them you need to be comfortable with for the NCLEX. We'll go through the ones that are important. Uh, but generally what you tend to see is shortness of breath, palpitations, this feeling of your heart skipping a beat, uh, your patients may syncopize. Uh, this is the typical things that you see in arrhythmias, no matter what the cause. Uh, a regular pulse you can, you can usually feel actually on physical exam, just placing your uh, fingers on that brachial artery. You can usually feel that um, uh, radial artery, excuse me, you can feel that irregular pulse. Uh, many different tests. ECG obviously would be the most important. Holter monitor is essentially an ECG that your clients can wear around with them. And so rather than being hooked up to the EKG machine, you've seen the size of these machines. You know, they've got 12 leads, you know, they're on a cart. You know, that's not really realistic when your uh, client is going to the bathroom every 15 minutes. And so a Holter monitor is essentially going to have leads attached to it, have leads attached to your client, but they wear it around their neck. And so it's able to pick up on these signals and transmit them to a remote location. Any um, hospital that has a um, telemetry, telemetry essentially means that their clients have Holter monitors and are being monitored at all times. Okay. Um, depending on the cause, if it's a fibrillation, like ventricular fibrillation, you can defibrillate your patient. Other causes, you should not defibrillate your patient. A uh, pacemaker can help to uh, restore a regular rhythm of the heart that originates in the atria and goes to the ventricles. And medications can also, um, can also put a stop to some arrhythmias. So let's talk about some of our supraventricular tachyarrhythmias. So this is, again, above the ventricles. We have our SA node that transmits to the atria. We have our AV node that transmits to the ventricles. And then we have a connection in between these two. This, the difference between supraventricular and ventricular tach tachyarrhythmias is this line here. A supraventricular tachyarrhythmias means it's above the AV node. So it is originating from the SA node, from the atrial muscle, uh, something is disordered here above the ventricles. A ventricular tachyarrhythmia means it's at the level of the AV node, at the level of the bundle branches, the level of the Purkinje fiber, somewhere in there is where the pathology exists. Okay. Uh, for our supraventricular tachyarrhythmia, it's probably the most important um, EKG finding, pathologic EKG finding that you need to know for the NCLEX is AFib. AFib is relatively easy to see, but you need to be looking for it. That's the problem is that if you know what you're looking for, it's very easy to diagnose on an EKG. But if you don't know what you're looking for, you're never going to see it. So what do we look for? Exactly. Yes. Lack of P waves. If you do see P waves, they're going to be very, 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 very small. And so um, you need to go off more than that though. So because our atria are fibrillating, they're not working the way, the way that they should. The other thing that's going to happen is you're going to have this abnormal QRS. It's called irregularly irregular, which I think, you know, these cardiologists just have fun naming things. Uh, your QRS complexes, rather than being marching out every QRS at a certain number of big boxes, right? Say every three big boxes, you have a QRS. You wait another three big boxes, another QRS. Another three big boxes, another QRS. Here, it'll be four big boxes to a QRS, and then two, and then three, and then four again. And so seeing that irregularity to your QRSs is another really huge help in diagnosing AFib, as well as the lack of P waves, as you mentioned. For me, looking at EKGs, uh, sometimes I'll feel like I can see a P wave and then someone will look over my shoulder and say, you idiot, that's not a P wave. Um, sometimes I won't see a P wave and then someone will look over the sh my shoulder and say, you idiot, that's the P wave right there. So for me, it was kind of hard to use that particular criteria to diagnose this. For me, just being able to march out these QRS complexes and noticing that there's some irregularity in the time between them, I would look at that first and then go to the P wave and say, do I see a, P, a good P wave? No, okay, I'm gonna think AFib, okay? Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, this QRS, it's huge. It's, it's so, 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 so helpful. Okay, and we'll look at some AFib in a minute. Uh, sinus tachycardia, essentially this is just elevated ventricular rhythm and rate. Nothing, nothing fancy there. Paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, this is a, you, you may have a slightly abnormal with a normal QRS. This, this one you do not need to know. I'm gonna, actually, let me put, um, uh, so I'm just going to circle the ones you really need to know. Okay, so AFib, you need, really need to know. A flutter, you very need to, you really need to know. What do we look for with a flutter? Good. Yes, yeah, very big, wide um, uh, QRS complexes. Very good. Yes, so with a flutter, what you described uh, when I was hearing you is you have very rapid, essentially P waves is what they are, uh, followed by you saw something like this, right? And then you're going to have the same thing again, and then another QRS. And the key here is that the QRS complexes should still march out. So this one is not irregular. If you have three boxes in between these two QRS, you should have three boxes in between the next two. Uh, and, and for the flutter waves, you should have the same number of flutter waves in between QRSs. So if you have three here, there should be three here, should be three here. And just the, 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 um, the way it looks, they, they describe it as sawtooth, right? Like a, the tooth of a, of a saw. And I really think it looks like that. And so that's a helpful way of um, picking it out in a question stem as well. Uh, paroxysmal uh, supraventricular tachycardia. Again, this is something that uh, that um, you. I think I think supraventricular tachycardia. You do need to be able to identify. Paroxysmal just means it kind of comes and goes. With supraventricular tachycardia, you're looking for very, very, very narrow. I'm talking hair thin QRS complexes, and they should be coming very rapidly, less than a box between each of them. Okay. Multifocal atrial tachycardia. This is some cardiology stuff. Don't worry about this one. Uh, ventricular tachycardia, VTAC. Again, we look for uh, very large, uh, wide QRS complexes. This is one that we need to be able to identify. Uh, premature ventricular contraction. This is almost as if um, sort of a, <clears throat> a precursor to VTAC almost. We see very wide QRS complexes, um, sort of intermittently and so not constantly but uh, every once in a while we'll see this very wide qrs complex and that is a premature ventricular contraction and then v fib another one that we need to identify is just a completely disordered um uh, ekg okay it's really just looking like um just a complete mess is our v fib all of our uh, muscle is totally um, beating independently and not pumping blood to our brain or our body. We have no effective cardiac output, and this is why we have those uh, AEDs uh, around us in the mall and everywhere else, we're, everywhere else we go because we need to rapidly defibrillate this patient and restore a normal heartbeat. Okay? Great. Uh, Brady arrhythmia is just, just uh, much slower heartbeats um you can have a primary with a you know a, a large pr interval secondary is a pr interval increase um uh, secondary type 2 is a, a pr interval that does not change and so with secondary mobitz type 1 we have a pr interval that slowly gets larger 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 and with secondary type 2 the pr interval just stays large uh tertiary we have no connection between the um the ventricles and the atria uh, bundle branch blocks is where we have, you know, we saw those bundle branches before where one of those branches is not connected to the rest of the system. And is so that particular ventricle takes a little bit longer to beat. And sinus Brady is a very slow heartbeat. Um, I would say that of the Brady arrhythmias, this is the one that you need to know. Okay. Great. And so here is sort of our first test in um, looking for um, arrhythmias. If you could uh, have a look at this, tell me what you see, tell me what looks abnormal, what looks okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
So uh, the fib relation, right? Fib, yeah, good. So uh, like you said, uh, the P waves, maybe you could say this is a P wave, but it's not It's not a very pretty P wave. This is, this is the ugly duckling of P waves. Um, and a lot of these other uh, QRS complexes don't have any P wave at all. And so that's sort of the first thing you can say, okay, now it's possibly a fib. Maybe I'm just not looking hard enough for P waves. But then you go and look at the number of boxes in between. So here we have about four boxes in between. Then it goes down to about three and a half. Now we're, it's less than three, less than three, less than three, getting bigger again. Now we're at three and a half. Okay, so that's, that is what we call irregular, irregularly irregular. And so that is a strong sign of AFib. Uh, very good. So atrial fibrillation. Uh, the atrial rate is actually very, very high. 350 to 650 beats per minute. However, because the atria are not beating as in synchronicity as one united muscle, it's impossible to detect those atrial contractions. And so while the heart rate is actually very, very high, we can't detect it on EKG. Rhythm irregular, uh, P wave fibrillatory, fine to course. PR interval is, you can't really appreciate it because there's no uh, P wave. QRS should be normal. We're looking for less than three boxes, like you told me. Very good. Okay, next one, what do we see here? Yes, I agree. Excellent. Yes, atrial flutter. Uh, seeing this sawtooth wave, uh, the way you went through it was absolutely perfect, by the way. Very systematic. Apply that to every single EKG question, and you're going to be absolutely fine. Got to have a system that you do this, but when you do, um, you're in a much better shape. Uh, so... Like you said, um, seeing those P waves, the P waves are the problem. Uh, there's multiple of them, and they're not all followed by a QRS. However, those that are, are being followed at a regular interval. And so, so we're okay with that. That is an atrial flutter. Very good. Our sawtooth P wave, yes. Okay, so what do we think of this particular EKG? Excellent. It almost looks like one box. Mm -hmm. Good. Superventricular tachycardia, good. So here we do have P waves. You can't really see it too well because it's kind of covered up with our T wave of the ventricular depolarization, I'm sorry, repolarization. However, there is a bit of a P wave here, um, just from that second hump. Uh, we know it's a supraventricular because of how narrow the QRS is, okay? This is why I emphasize it so much, because it helps so much in, in, in eliminating these. If you know that the QRS is under three boxes, um, then you can eliminate anything that has an origin in the ventricles or the AV node. Uh, if it's more than three boxes, now you can eliminate anything that's from the um, the atria. So our supraventricular tachycardia, uh, we could eliminate that if our QRS was greater than three boxes. Okay, that's, so that's that's really, um, I feel, a helpful way of cutting through these. Any questions on this one? No? Okay, great. Okay, what do we think about this one? Mm hmm mm hmm Sh 
sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, th that's sort of one of the problems of your EKG machine. Depending on exactly where you place the lead, um, you may get a, a higher or or shorter um, QRS. Um, however, it should be pretty consistent. Um, and so there are some conditions where you'll see um, big variations in the QRS complexes. And if you're not moving the leads, that should not be normal. The variations that we see here are normal. Um, the, the variations are very slight. However, like you said, these, these do look taller than in um, other patients. Um, uh, thinking back now, I think that much taller uh, QRS complexes can be indicative of... Um, uh, cardiomyopathy. And so when you start to have that muscle grow in the wall of your heart, um, you can get bigger QRS complexes now that I'm thinking about it. But in terms of diagnosing your arrhythmias, it's not helpful at all. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. Definitely. Yeah, and it, 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 this, it is tachycardic. Here, this would just be a sinus tachycardia. And so this is kind of... Exactly. Very good. Very good. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. No, very good. Um, and so that's our way of, of differentiating it. Um, and so it, and if you don't feel like counting, look for this, where you're having the overlap of the T wave and the P wave. That's That's very pathologic. And so... Um, that's something that you see more in supraventricular versus sinus. You don't really see that overlap. Okay. Cause there's enough time essentially. The T wave is not especially prominent here. Um, I'm not really sure why typically you would see a T wave in sinus tachycardia. Okay. So great heart rate, heart rate greater than hundred rhythms, regular P wave before each QRS. They should be the same PR interval, uh, 0.12 to 0 0.20 and our QRS should be a normal length. Okay, what do we think about this bad boy? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> it's, it's very ugly. Uh, this is going to be not V fib. It is ventricular. This is going to be V tac. And the reason that this the reason that this is not V fib is that in V fib uh, you have a complete disorder of your cardiac rhythm. So rather than seeing, uh, I mean, this at least has a rhythm, right? And and V. And V fib really look for just a complete, um, you know, just just a mess, just a just a spaghetti of um, of your EKG. It is not going to have any, um, you know, regular rhythm. Here we have a regular rhythm. We have QRS complexes, believe it or not. They're just so wide that they kind of take up all of the rest of the regular EKG. Okay. All right. Great. So um, here um, we have a uh, following on the ECG monitor. The nurse would evaluate this arrhythmia as which of the following? Mm -hmm. Excellent, good. Are so large, wonderful, very good, very good. Okay, so we have another question here. Uh, in the emergency room, the nurse is caring for a client who reports substernal pain radiating to the arm and jaw, shortness of breath, feeling of impending doom. The client had a stroke one month ago. Uh, client's vital signs are 146 over 72, pulse 128, respirations 36. Oh my goodness. Uh, 12 lead ECG uh, reveals evolving acute myocardial infarction. Which of the following physician orders should the nurse question? Sure. 
So have one more. L yeah. So go ahead. Sorry. What'd you say you were leaning towards? Okay. So what I'd like you to do is have one more look at the question stem, read it over one, one time. And, um, and, uh, in these types of questions, you want to find something that would say you can't do it. Right. That would say this is going to cause a problem. Right. I, I, the the I, what I will tell you right now is every single one of these drugs that are listed is indicated for a myocardial infarction. However, for this patient, um, there's a reason you can't give one of these drugs. Not shortness of breath. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's part of that's one of the symptoms of a uh, of uh, a heart attack as well—a feeling of impending doom. <laughs> Sounds pretty dramatic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Good. So, um, so, so good. So, um, essentially all of these, all of these things, um, all of the symptoms that this client has, all of the drugs that are listed, these are all consistent with a myocardial infarction. Those are the symptoms that you should have. Those are the vitals that you should see. And those are the drugs you should give. The thing that um, that we should be concerned about is this history of a stroke one month ago. Okay, and so while they kind of slipped this in here, they kind of slipped it in without you know really giving you a lot of information. But the problem, so a stroke is essentially where you have a ischemia to the brain. When you have a stroke, uh, you know you have to go on some treatment, prevent the fu future ischemia. But when you're in this time period of one month. There's uh, parts of you, that stroked area that are still trying to recoup. We have connective tissue that's being built and everything else. And so what might happen if we give a thrombolytic to someone who recently had a stroke? Exactly. Great. So um, one of the clots that we're really concerned about is the clot that's, that's there in the brain in that area that the patient stroked on. So now it's blocking any blood from leaving that area and get, and um, you know, we don't want this client to bleed into their brain, essentially. That's the whole idea with strokes, is that when you have a stroke, uh, if it's an ischemic stroke, you have an area of your brain that loses oxygen supply. And whatever happens, you're going to have, you know, uh, connective tissue that's put there, scar tissue that's put there. Um, you're gonna have clots that form there. Um, and you know, that part of the brain's gonna be dead. You know, when you have a stroke, oftentimes that part of the brain just dies. Now, if you, while this this part of the brain is still trying to recoup, still trying to build up, uh, you know, all this connective tissue, wall itself off from the blood supply, if you give a thrombolytic, you're going to break down any of that, um, of the clotted area 
that's protecting blood from getting into the brain. Now the blood may freely get into the parenchyma of the brain, and now you have a bleed on the brain, and your client is going to restroke again. Okay, and so uh, if you have clients who have had strokes recently, you cannot give them thrombolytics because you're worried that you're going to cause a hemorrhagic stroke. Okay, all right. So, uh, yes, yeah. So that's okay. That's all right. Um, and this is how they try and trick you. They they slip it in like this. So all of these drugs are okay to give for MI. Um, these should be uh, sort of on uh, you know uh, one of those things that you you can easily list off. Right? A client comes in with MI, I'm going to give a beta blocker, morphine, nitroglycerin, thrombolytic, oxygen, um, and I'm going to give them heparin, I'm going to give them, uh, I'm going to position them so that they're getting enough um, blood supply back to the heart. Those are all the things that you should instantly think of. Um, but and when it comes to giving thrombolytics, your TPA, uh, you should not do that if your client has had a stroke in the past. Okay, the other reasons you would not want to give uh, a thrombolytic, say you had a client who had some sort of surgery within the past three weeks. Would you want to give that patient a thrombolytic? Why? Say they had, um, you know, some sort of gallbladder surgery that had to be open gallbladder. They had to open the abdomen. They took the gallbladder out. They sewed the patient up. Three weeks later, they come back with an MI. Are you going to give them a thrombolytic? You said no. I'm asking why. That's okay. Excellent. Yes. Yes. You're absolutely right. So they're still healing. They're still healing. There's areas when you cut open someone's abdomen, you have to cut through vessels. Those vessels, their way of healing themselves is to form clots. That's what they do. They form clots. Once they're able to reconstitute some of the wall of the vessel and connect with whatever vessel it was cut off from, then it, the clot will break up. However, that clot is preventing um, you know, the body from bleeding out anytime you get a cut. Clots can be beneficial, right? There is a reason we have this system. If, they're, if their system is trying to heal and you give a thrombolytic, now everywhere that every vessel that you cut through is now going to be actively bleeding again. And so this client's going to be essentially bleeding into their abdomen because of the thrombolytic. And so think about, think about it that way. Any client that's still healing, you do not want to give thrombolytics. Okay, good. Very, very good. Okay, next. Progressive care unit nurse assessing the following cardiac rhythm. What do you think of it? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. So uh, let's let's take a minute to talk about those. So uh, for your second degree AV blocks, essentially, um, th there's two different secondary AV blocks. So the first one is Mobitz 1. Mobitz 1. And this is so this is our second degree, right? We have Mobitz 1 and then we have a Mobitz 2. So for our Mobitz 1, um, essentially what's going to happen is the interval between the P wave and the R wave of your QRS is going to get progressively longer. And so for our first complex, here's our P wave, here's our QRS, okay, and a T. Next, here's our next P wave, and now we have a little bit of a lengthening between our QRS 
and then a T. And then we have another P wave and a nice long lengthening, a QRS and a T. And then last, you're gonna have a P wave with no QRS and then another P wave that restarts the whole cycle again. Okay, so that is our Mobitz type one. Absolutely. That's the, you're absolutely right. I love how you put that. It, it interferes with the pacing of the heart. And so uh, that's, that's what really what you want to look for is um, the transmission of signal between the P wave and the AV node. Something's disordered there causing these different problems. Uh, Mobitz type two, essentially you have a, you have a permanently lengthened PR wave, so it doesn't get longer and there's no drop. You just have a longer uh, PR wave and it stays the same length. Okay, uh, this you would never really be expected to identify that I think would be too difficult for the third degree third degree and a flutter actually have a lot in common. And so with third degree what you see is that the atria and the ventricles, they're both contracting, they both have a regular rhythm, but the rhythms don't match up. Okay, and so uh, while your rhythm for the atria may be every, you know, uh, 0.2 seconds. Uh, the rhythm for the ventricles, they have their own rhythm now. So they're going every 0.5 seconds. Okay. And so when you end up lining this up, it, it looks a lot like your A flutter where you have, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of a fluttering P wave and then a QRS complex, but it's not going to have the same number of P waves between QRSs typically. And some of the P waves may look a bit abnormal. So in, in A flutter, what you see is there's a P wave and a QRS. This is clearly a P wave before the QRS, right? When you have a third degree block, sometimes the QRS is gonna be on top of the P wave. And so as you start to see the uh, line go up for a P wave, all of a sudden then it turns into a QRS, okay? And so seeing some abnormalities like this where instead of having a set number of, of P waves for your flutter, a set number of QRSs, uh, you're having QRS is kind of laid on top of the of the uh, atrial rhythm. And so that would be your third degree block where it's a complete disconnection. Um, again, a little bit difficult to identify. I would be surprised if they asked you about that one. Um, the Mobitz type one of your second degree AV blocks, uh, I would I would say they're, they're, they'd be more likely to ask you about that where it's longer, longer, longer drop. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Right. Okay, good, good. A flutter. You're absolutely right. Yep. And so uh, looking for the sawtooth pattern, like you told me, um, there should be a nice regular rhythm. There should be an equal number of P waves in between each QRS complex. These are all the very, very typical things of, um, of a flutter. Okay, very good. Okay, next. An 82-year-old woman is admitted with a diagnosis of rapid AFib. The nurse has initiated telemetry monitoring per physician's order. Two hours after initiation of monitoring and alarm sounds at the central monitoring station, the client appears to be in what uh, is in what appears to be ventricular tachycardia. Oh no. So what of the following actions should the nurse take first? Okay, <laughs> I agree. Good. Excellent, very good. Uh, so this is one of the assess versus implement uh, question types that you'll see on the NCLEX art. I'm sure that you saw when you took it. And, um, you know, uh, sometimes it, 
taking action is not the first thing you want to do. And so uh, doing more assessment is definitely the key here. Uh, calling a code blue, obviously you wouldn't want to do that before assessing the client. However, what, what, what would cause you to call a code blue? Say we continue this question, you go and see the client, and then you decide to call code blue. What did you see? I'm essentially asking you non-responsive, good. Asystole, good. What about blood pressure? Really low, good. Yeah, low blood pressure, uh, asystole, um, a non-responsiveness. Yeah, definitely. I think, so blood pressure alone wouldn't be what causes me to call code blue. I would look for a depressed blood pressure with altered mental status, right? Or, you know, like symptomatic, essentially. If a patient has a very low blood pressure, 80 over 40, uh, that's concerning. Is there a medication I can give? Is there something that is in the chart that says give this if blood pressure gets low? Besides just calling a code blue because the client is, um, is, uh, has a low blood pressure. This may be something that's transient. If there, especially if there's no um, altered mental status, don't call the code blue. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if the blood pressure is 20 over zero, yeah, call the code blue. But uh, in general, um, you know, you, what you're going to see in questions is like probably what you described, 80 over 40. What do you do? Um, and, uh, surprisingly, some people, you know, just need a little bit of a, of a presser and they'll be okay. You don't really need to call the code blue. Okay. All right. So this is the OG Yoda, no baby Yoda here. Keep studying. You must sleep and cry after you pass NCLEX, you will. Okay. No time for sleeping. No time for crying. You're going for the NCLEX. Uh, 